Good morning, everybody. Who here checked in code in the last week? Okay, those who don't raise their hands, I, I'm pretty sure the organizers are happy to give you your money back. Um, because I really kind of ask myself, why are you at a developer conference when you didn't check in any code? Um, and this is the problem. This is the problem um, in our industry, is that we talk too much about code and we don't write enough code. Um, and I'm pretty sure that most of you do Scrum or Agile at work. Um, and I think Agile is a cancer that we have to eliminate from the industry. Okay. So if you go to Wikipedia, which is the source of all my knowledge, and you search for, for Scrum, oh, holy smokes. You find all kind of good things. It's flexible, it's holistic, it challenges the traditional approach. You can self-organize. Wow, doesn't that make you feel powerful? I can self-organize. What the fuck, the manager should, I mean, they should get kind of out of here, okay? And uh, all kind of goodness. The problem is that Scrum is all buzzwords, okay? It's talking about code except writing code. Now, many of you, I'm pretty sure, uh, since you're doing agile at work, have suffered to stand-up meetings. And I'm pretty sure that you've been kind of thinking about this, you know. Who the fuck, why, when did they last check in code? Oh, yes, oh, man, I have a hangover yesterday. Stop this crap. I, I just need to go behind my screen. I want to watch cat videos. Okay. Every stand-up that you do, is, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That is seven people times 10 minutes. That's one hour less to write code, okay? So stand-ups are, I think, the worst thing ever invented. Okay, and then let's look at some other cool stuff. Planning poker. Ah, oh, makes you feel like James Bond. Ah, I'm playing poker, <laughs> planning poker. And there's even a freaking company that makes cards. Planning poker cards. Can you imagine this? I mean, what's happening to us? Okay, so when you come home and your kid asks you, Mom or Dad, what do you do for work? This is how you feel. Hey, kid, I'm an agile developer. We are all clowns. Okay, if we do agile, we're clowns. We're nothing better than Ronald McDonald. Okay. And, and, and why are we just doing this, okay? Why don't we vote with our feet? Why do we go every morning to the stand-ups? Why do we play pan planning poker? Why do we do burn down charts? Oh, maybe because we are scrum master. That sounds good, I'm a master, I'm a scrum master. Fuck, it's like you know, some, some, some kind of trivial exercise you do on the web. Scrum master, if it's called master, it probably is very useless, okay? It's worthless because it has a fancy title. Okay. Now, the other thing, if you uh, looked at the original description of Scrum, is that it talks about evidence-based. And, uh, so, and it's really, when people use these words like evidence or science or master, you have to be really careful because probably you're being scammed. Because when they use those words, they're trying to hide something, okay? And the big thing with Scrum is there is no evidence at all. If you go to Wikipedia and you look for empirical research, it means that you have proof, okay? But how do we know that a stand-up meeting has to take 10 minutes? Why not seven minutes? Why not 11 and a half minutes? How do we know 10 minutes is optimal? Where's the evidence? There's no evidence, it's all anecdotes, okay? And we're just there like toddlers, you know, subjecting ourselves to this nonsense. All right. Then, here is the worst thing about Agile. We're being fucked. You're being fucked. You're being fucked. You're being fucked, okay? Because one of the kind of, you know, fundaments of Agile is so-called subtle control. Okay, so you are not a self-organizing team. The freaking managers are still in charge. Only 
they do it with shuttle control, okay? They're not telling you what to do, they're doing it shuttily, so you're like sheep, okay? Now, if you search for shuttle control, this is like abuse, <laughs> okay? So we are being abused by our managers. And these managers love it because we think, oh, we're self-organizing. But in the meantime, we're all being fucked. Okay. So, what, 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 why does this work? Well, because Agile is a pure pyramid scheme. So you can start with certified Scrum developer, tester. Who here, you know, how can you have a career as a tester? Oh, but if I'm an agile tester, suddenly, you know, my career is going in, in uh, warp speed. This is all a big pyramid scheme. And we're playing the game. Okay? <laughs> and Jeff Sutherland is our Jesus. Now it's time to view him as our Satan. <laughs> so, if there's one thing that you take home from this talk, is that we should end Scrum and Agile. We are developers. We write code. We don't talk about code. We write code. And if you want to know more, so like, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I have just a few minutes to talk about this, but Bertrand Meyer wrote a great book where he debunks the whole Agile myth. Okay, he did investigative journalism. He became a scrum master. He injected himself for, for three years into to this agile movement. And this book is fantastic. After you read this book, you know, you will believe me. Okay, so what's the alternative? Okay, so the alternative is the hacker way. And Mark Zuckerberg um, here, look at, like, yeah, look how beautiful he looks. I mean, <laughs> handsome guy. Um, but one of the remarkable things is that when um, Facebook did their IPO, he wrote a letter to the shareholders to explain them the hacker way. Okay? And Facebook, if you, it's located on one hacker way. So that's a nice pun, because it's like, you know, there's only one hacker way. Um, and if you ever are in Silicon Valley and you get a chance to visit the Facebook campus, I really urge you to do that. They live and breathe the hacker spirit. And I think the hacker spirit is, it, it captures a lot of the things that Agile tries to do, but it does it from a developer point of view, okay? And so here's the thing. So hackers always believe that things can be done better and that things are not complete. Well, that's kind of what the agile people say as well. Um, except that, you know, this is hands-on. It's like, you know, hackers always try to release code. The other thing here, which is super important, is that code always wins, okay? So this is the thing. That's what the agile people want to forget you. Subtle control. The manager always wins. No, it's code that always wins. It's not who is in charge. It's not who can talk the smoothest. It's not who in the stand-up meetings kind of, you know, is going to shift around these yellow sticky notes. I think there's also kind of some hidden connection between 3M that sells the kind of, you know, sticky notes <laughs> and the agile scrum foundation, okay? So here it is. The hacker culture is all about how good you are, okay? It doesn't matter how you look, doesn't matter anything, it just matters the quality of your code. And that's the spirit that I want to kind of, you know, get in this world. Good. Now let's zoom out a little bit, okay? Because one of the things I think that Scrum completely misses is why on earth do we write software, okay? What is the goal of our existence? And the goal of writing software is because we're running a business, okay? So what, and then you can ask yourself, what is the goal of a business? Well, let's um, use some mathematics. So instead of anecdotes and, and stories and whatever, let's use some mathematics. And Leslie Lamport, who won the Turing Award, by the way, 
that's not uh, job security because Microsoft um, fired everybody in Microsoft Research Silicon Valley. I'm not sure if Lamport is also fired, but uh, anyway, he, Lamport, I think, has a really good advice, is that you should look at mathematics. Mathematics has been used for thousands of years to design and model things. And what do we do? What do we do as computer scientists? The first thing we do is we forget about math. We are scared about math. Why? We should not be scared about math because we are doing math. When you write code, you're building a proof. So we are doing math, so we should use that. And let's go to some math. I'm pretty sure if you've done electrical engineering or mechanical engineering, you get you know, at least one course in control theory. Um, control theory is all about feedback systems. Computer science is also about feedback systems, but most computer science departments don't teach control theory, so that's sad. But anyway, so I'm going to kind of, you know, make this a little bit simple. So the goal of a company is to create output based on input from the market. And one way to do that is to kind of constantly have a feedback loop where you check what you produce and compare that what the market wants and make sure that this is optimal. Another way to look at this is reinforcement learning. I don't know if you have done any kind of machine learning or AI or game development. This is a very popular thing. So the agent here is the company. The agent takes actions and the environment, which is you know, the market, the world, the real world, gives you two pieces of information. One is the new state, because the world constantly changes, and the other one is the rewards. And now the goal of every company is to maximize the sum of rewards over time. Okay? And now the rewards, it doesn't have to be money, it doesn't have to be you know, profits, it can also be you know, create happiness for developers or you know, eliminate cancer from the world. But this is kind of you know, the picture that you have to keep in mind. Okay? And if we model the, an enterprise like this, then we can kind of you know, start to apply some math. And in particular, we can now look at a company as a software system. Because there's no difference of between using reinforcement learning to do a game, to do chess, and win from everybody, or model your company like this and beat every other company. Okay? So if we treat a company like a software system and apply recursively our own skills to running a business, we can beat everybody. Of course, if, if you know, people outside this room are starting to do the same, it gets harder and harder. So don't talk about this, you know, don't tweet, you know, let's keep this between, between us. Okay, now here are a, a couple of anomalies um, that happen when we kind of simplify uh, these systems. So here is uh, what sometimes happens is when companies say, you know what, I don't need any feedback loops. I just take the input, I produce the output, and you know, because I know what I'm doing. Well, this model works really well when you have a perfect model, perfect understanding of your environment, and your environment doesn't change. Okay? But of course, in practice, this doesn't work. And we all know an example, maybe not here in, in Helsinki, where it seems to be like, you know, constantly gray and raining and cold. Um, but if you go to Silicon Valley, it's always dry, but people want their grass, of course, to be green. So they have sprinklers. And these sprinklers are like no feedback system, so they are tied to a timer. And even, even when it rains, it doesn't rain that often in Silicon Valley, but even when it rains, the timer will turn on the sprinklers. Okay? So the sprinkler system doesn't take into account feedback from the environment. It just has the inputs, which is like, turn on the sprinkler at this time, and it produces the output. So there you can see that that's not a good strategy. Okay? 
So if you build your company to just take the input and produce output without any feedback, you're like a sprinkler. You're stupid. OK. So what we should do is we should have continuous improvement. So every time we produce output, we should have feedback to um, back into the system such that we can improve the output and make sure that the output that we produce matches the input. Now, there are a lot of problems with this, and I will go um, with you through this. So it looks really easy, but this, this is harder than you think. But let's first give a couple of good examples. I don't know, does um, Uber exist here? People know about Uber? Well, OK. Uber is the best thing on Earth. OK? Um, here's what you do. You have an app, and you want to, have, you want to you know, go somewhere. Um, if you want to take a taxi cab, well, most taxi cabs are dirty, or well, here, not in Europe, usually they're here at Mercedes or whatever, but in the US, they're often old cop cars, you know, like Fords, they're really dirty, you know, the people don't care about because they don't own the cars. With Uber, you click on your app, and you see all the cars that are close by, and then the car that's closest comes, picks you up, and then you get like a little thing. It says like two minutes wait, and the guy comes in. Your credit card is integrated in the app, so when you leave the taxi, everything is paid. You don't have to do anything. Um, if you search a little bit about Uber, there's also Lyft and Sidecar, similar companies. The traditional taxi cabs hate those, okay, because they're, these people are kind of you know, shaking up the market. But now look at this Uber thing. Okay, the, f the interesting thing about Uber is that Uber is a taxi company, but they don't own any taxis, okay? The only thing that Uber has, because all the taxis, all those cars, are just private drivers. They work for Uber, but Uber doesn't own any taxis. The only thing that Uber knows is the, is the data and the algorithms, and they continu continuously optimize they know exactly where the demand is, so they can push the drivers to, you know, oh, the theater is closing, so you should go there. So this is a purely data-driven, feedback-driven company, a taxi company that is only software, all right? That's amazing. I think this is the amazing thing, is that software is doing everything. And a few years from now, even those taxi drivers that, you know, that work for Uber will be disappearing because now the taxi driver is replaced by software. Okay, so this will all be self-driving cars. Now, how do you think self-driving cars work? Well, they use the data, they have continuous feedback as the car drives over the road, you learn better properties of the road and it continues to improve. Okay, so here you see a few examples of building a, a, a company by applying software technology to the company. So you're, you're running the company as if it's a software product. Um, and I think it goes very, very far, okay? Because even medicine is turning into software. If you need a new heart five years from now, you just go to your doctor's office, the doctor will hit a button, you know, there will be a 3D printer and your new heart will be printed. Or maybe, I don't know, they put some probes into your, you know, chest and it will print in there. Okay, so I'm pretty sure everything is turning into software. So this is a great, great time for people that write software. The ones that raised their hands in the beginning, the other ones that didn't check in any software, I'm really sorry. You will probably be sleeping under the bridge with a liter of vodka, like, oh, I'm so shit, I didn't write any code, now I'm useless. <laughs> okay? So, if you haven't checked in any code, I would say quit the conference and go, kind of maybe, you know, get some JavaScript books or, or something like that, okay? Because software is eating the world. Um, even the hardware, if you look at, that's another very interesting trend, is that hardware is becoming software. 
Now, people talk a lot about cloud computing, and I have no fucking clue what cloud computing means. It's a marketing term. It's another one, if I had hair, I, you know, I would now put up the pointy hair and say cloud computing, blah, blah, blah. But really, really what cloud computing is, it's turning hardware into software. And that's great. And um, for example, Netflix, they don't have any machines. Everything runs on Amazon. And they leave the, the hardware to those guys. And now you want a new machine? It's just an API call. Okay? You want to shut down the machine? It's just an API call. So even hardware becomes software. This is amazing. I, I, I mean, just think about it. We are living in a world where everything is powered by software. And we write the software, uh, those of us that write the software, <laughs> OK? It's like, you know, it's like being in a dream. I don't know. It's, it, it's just super amazing. Now, let me show you some other anomalies, what can happen. And um, this is what happened um, to Microsoft, for example. If you look at uh, uh, Microsoft Office, for the longest time, they followed this model with feedback. So for every new release of Office, they would bring in customers. This was before the internet, so they would bring in physical customers, put them behind like you know a um, half mirror such that the customers could not see the people observing them. But you know there were people with clipboards observing what the customers, how they used Office, and then based on how the consumers used Office. The, the product would be improved. But then Microsoft got arrogant. Office got arrogant. They got deaf to the environment. And guess what? Not only did they drop the feedback loop, they did even ignored the input. They just produced output. It's like, hey, we're Microsoft. The new version of Office comes out. Everybody, all you suckers will buy it anyway because your managers have signed some agreement to kind of, you know, get like every year new version of Office. So, hey, we can do whatever we want. And that's when we got the ribbon. <laughs> okay? The ribbon is an example of just producing something without any feedback and without taking any input into account. But that, you know, to show that Microsoft was really deaf, the next thing was Windows 8, where's my fucking start menu? <laughs> okay, how is this possible? People had 25 years of muscle memory on, to use Windows. I don't think anybody here loves to use Windows, but at least you know you have to, so you know you you know you kind of don't want to think about it. And now suddenly you had to think about it. Bad, bad mistake. Okay. Now here's the the thing that needs to happen. When you look at this feedback loop that I showed you, companies have a feedback loop too. And we all know from the feedback loop that when you have a feedback loop, when you have a finite state machine, there's memory in the feedback loop. Okay? So when your company gets deaf or when the environment changes, you have to prune that memory. Okay? So let's zoom in a little bit here. Okay? So let's even simplify this feedback loop to here a mealy machine. Everybody remembers what a mealy machine is? No? You if not, Go to Wikipedia, search for Mealy Machine. A Mealy Machine is a finite state machine that transfers inputs into outputs and maintains some state. And every time it gets a new input, it mutates the state. But that's exactly the problem, because that state might get polluted. That state might be, you know, you know Fortran. You're a Fortran programmer, but the world now does JavaScript. So what does that mean? You have to be kicked out of the cash. You have to start drinking vodka with the other people <laughs> that didn't kind of, you know, code. Okay. The other thing, what is super important, anybody seen this movie, World War Z? It's a terrible movie, <laughs> but there's one great lesson in this movie. Okay, so this is about zombies. Um, and everybody, the zombies are taking over the world, except in Jerusalem. Okay? Now this guy comes in and kind of, you know, asks, you know, because he's investigating why this is, 
And then they tell him this. That, and this apparently is true. The Israeli army has this. And it's called the tent man. Okay? So if nine people agree, the tent man must disagree. Okay? And this is to kind of you know, create some, some disturbance in the system, such that you don't smoke your own tailpipe. Okay? Because here, this is like smoking your own tailpipe. The state is fed back into the system, and so the role of the tent man is to disturb this state such that, you know, you don't get to believe your own crap. And we all do this. We all believe that we're perfect, that our code is the best. So the tent man says, your code is a piece of shit, okay? Or we should move from JavaScript to Dart. And they say, oh, no, 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 let's go to Fortran. Back to Fortran, that was good code, okay? So no matter how improbable, this tent man must be there. Now, look at your own companies. If you have an opposing view, the shuttle, what shuttle management will do is that you will be put in a role where you have no relevance, okay? That's the whole point of shuttle management. So shuttle management goes against this, and so every company that practices that, in my opinion, will go down because they don't refresh their state. Okay? And again, if you look at computer science, what I say, let's keep applying computer science to, uh, to running a company. And this is what we do all the time. When you have a cache, the cache gets full, and you have to eliminate stuff from the cache. And there's a whole kind of way, you know, like a whole theory on how to do that. But every company has a cache too. And every once in a while, you have to clean up that cache. Now, what does that mean for you personally? It's that you should never stick around in the same company for more than three years. That's maximum. After three years, you know, you know everything, you know everybody, and now you stop developing. So you should purge yourself from the cash. Okay? And often when you jump to another company, you get more salary. And I will talk about that uh, in a minute. But, you know, so this is also some of your own responsibility. And especially if you do agile, you should purge yourself immediately from the cash. <laughs> okay, now you, you might have heard that Microsoft has fired, like, you know, thousands of people. Um, and the real reason, it's not only about focus, but it's here. It's not about money, it's about culture. Because the world has changed. Microsoft, the cash of Microsoft, the people that work at Microsoft, are optimized for making boxed products. But the world has changed, okay? So now you have to purge the cash, fire those people, and get new ones. But what we should do as developers, we should never be caught ourselves in this situation, okay? If we are the ones that get purged out of the cash, then it means that we have been blind. Okay, we have been sleeping because we have always be kind of we have to be at the front. Okay, but this is kind of very important that kind of you know that that this more like this is really what it's about. Okay, these layoffs are about cleaning the cash, and I think every company should kind of clean their cash every so often. Okay, as I said, hardware is software, um, and what does that mean? It means that writing software becomes harder because, because the software now runs on hardware and the hardware people are not as smart as us. Our software always runs, has never bugs, but hardware fails, unfortunately. And now this kind of, you know, propagates. So now our software suddenly fails because of the stupid hardware people, okay? So, so the thing now is that when you run your software like this, you know that it will fail. So what we need to do is we need to start writing software in a different way. And one way is to make it fail on purpose, okay? And if you look at Netflix, for example, they have this thing called Chaos Monkey, where they just on purpose make the software fail. Um, I don't know if you read recently Facebook, they just turned, you know, turned off a data center on purpose. 
to make sure that, you know, this thing, that everything still ran, even though there are failures. Now, probably you have been doing TDD, because that's agile. Ha, 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 who is doing TDD? This is so ridiculous. Do you think that you can kind of, you know, model the real failures that can happen in production, you know, when you're doing test-driven development? No, okay? So the only way you can create your software is to just put it in production because it will fail. And it will fail maybe because you made a bug or be be because the machine went down, but it will fail anyway. So you just put it in production. And then when it fails, you just roll back to the previous version. But there's no way you can pretend you can test your software beforehand. So all this TDD crap, forget about it. If your company does TDD, what do you do? Leave, you quit. You hand in your resignation today. Okay, because this is old fashioned stuff. This is again, this is anecdotes. There's no proof. Yeah, and, but we feel good. Why do we feel good? Because we're not doing any work. We're not writing real code, we're writing tests. Writing tests is waste. And I thought that Agile was against waste. Okay, so it, Agile is so full of contradictions. It's, it's just amazing. Okay, so this is the motto. Move fast, break things. We should not be afraid. TDD is for scared people. It's for pussies. <laughs> like, okay? Just do it. You put it in production. If it breaks, it will break. You fix it. Okay. Next thing. How do we build systems? Well, I think the most... We talk a lot about architecture, software architecture, now microservices is the newest hype. We love these hypes. The only architecture that I know, and I'm old, fat, bald, ugly, but this thing has been, is even older than me, okay? This is the OSI layered architecture. The reason that we can tweet is because some old guys with big bellies and beards Kind of, you know, came up with this architecture that's layered. It's layered, and no layer can kind of, you can only talk from layer n to layer n minus one. It's very strict, layered, okay? That works. Now let's look at other layered architectures. Let's look at the Catholic Church, <laughs> okay? Or any other church, okay? Most people do today are not part of any church, but you know, we still, the church has been around for 2,000 years, okay? No company has been around for 2,000 years. Why can the church be around so long? Because it's, it's a layered architecture, <laughs> okay? Now let me show you another thing that's even older. Well, of course, they're not very agile because I'm still waiting for their killer product, turning water into wine. It has taken 2,000 years for them to ship that, and I don't see that working yet, but anyway. But what are we doing? We keep denying, we keep forgetting that this thing works. And so we keep, you know, doing matrix organizations, whatever. Don't do it. A good organization is hierarchical. Okay, let's look at another hierarchical organization. The army, okay? In the army, there's a strict hierarchy. You can even see it. People have like, you know, signs where they are in the hierarchy. And then, of course, down at the bottom are the soldiers that do the dirty work. And that's us, the developers. I don't know about the people that don't write code where you belong. You're probably kind of, you know, the shooting targets for the, for the soldiers. Um, but they do all the work. Okay, and armies have been around for even like 5,000 years, and they still have the same structure, a strict hierarchical structure. So all our companies should be structured like hierarchical companies. Um, I can, there's one document I can really recommend. It's the Fleet Marine Force Manual Warfighting. It's, it's online, it's a PDF. And if you replace war by software, <laughs> it just fits. Okay, because writing software is like fighting a war. Okay, 
And, and this is what we have to learn. So no, none of this agile nonsense. Let's look at the military that has been doing this for thousands of years. Now, there's, what can we learn from this? Well, first of all, that war fighting is not for old people. Okay, so old guys like me should not be in this industry. And we can compare this with soccer players or sports. If you look at the World Cup soccer, okay, the average age is around 27 plus or minus one. This is not a normal distribution. This is not a power distribution. This is a straight line. Okay, so sports teams, these are young people. And what I want to do is I want to treat development teams like professional sports teams, okay? For between 22 and 32, 10 years, you do nothing but code. 24 seven, you code just like a professional athlete. Okay, do you think that the soccer player, do you think that Messi thinks about anything else than soccer? Do you think Messi cares about his kids, that you know, his kids has dirty <laughs> diapers? No, Messi only thinks about soccer. So we as developers, or you as developers, should only think about code. You should dream code, eat, drink code, only do coding. Okay, but that also means that you should earn as much as a professional soccer player. Now look at this, why on earth does Messi make $16 million a year, and you that write code, and you're a professional coder, you're as talented as Messi, what do you get? 60,000 euros, something like that? That's ridiculous, okay? So you should be able to work your ass off in 10 years and make all your money and then retire, okay? Now, in Europe, this is not common, but in Silicon Valley, this is the case. I know plenty of 24-year-old kids that are kind of financially independent. Well, I'm still staying in this kind of shack because I worked for Microsoft and the stock didn't do anything, <laughs> okay? But these people here, look, this guy says he makes $3 million. Other guy here, $100 million, okay? So this is the kind of salaries, if we want to treat developers, if we want to treat you like you should, we should pay them salaries like this, okay? And it means a shakeout, because not everybody is as talented as Messi. Okay, so probably of all of us, well, we already have half of us that didn't write code, so that's, the, those are gone. But of all the rest, I think, you know, we need to up our game. And now the other thing, I think one of the big problems, I need to speed up a little bit, one of the big problems with software projects, why they run over time, it has nothing to do with sprints and burn down charts. It has to do with the fact that software is too soft, okay? If any one of you, well, we've seen here the musician, okay? And if anybody of you plays music, like jazz music, you know that jazz music is not about free improvisation. Being creative in music is about putting constraints. You put very, very strict constraints. You know what chords you're going to play, you know what beat you're going to play, and then you are creative, okay? So the role of a manager is not subtle control. The role of a manager is to put context. Think about the soldiers. You tell a soldier, you're going to kind of, you know, go to Helsinki and you kind of capture that building. That's the goal. It doesn't matter. You can shoot everybody, you can throw bombs. Your goal is to kind of, you know, capture that building in Helsinki. And that's, that's all, that's your context. And within that, you can do what you want. That is what I call a self-organizing team. And the manager should get out of their fucking way, okay? And the, there you can read this talk, okay? We should treat people as racehorses, not as sheep. So all this subtle control stuff, it really makes me barf, I'm sorry. Okay, and this guy also says that Agile is that, so I'm not just a kind of a lunatic that says that. All right. If you go again to the military, you read that document, that's what they also say. Command must be decentralized. If you're in the middle of fighting a war, there cannot be any command. You have to trust the soldiers that they know exactly what they do and they will finish the job or they will die. And that's the same with us. Okay, the project is going to be finished and we will die for it. We will tw work 24 seven. We will drink you know, 20 Red Bulls. The code will be finished. 
And stand-ups is only taking away from the time that we write code. Jesus, why don't they understand it? Okay. Now, if, if you look at the army and the church, there's many, many layers. But I think in a software company, three layers are enough. There's the developers, and we treat those developers like kings. We give them salaries, millions of dollars, like professional athletes. Okay? Then we have the managers, and the only role of the managers is to set the context and to keep the developers happy, to make sure that you have that 50-inch uh, screen, to make sure that whenever there's a new iPhone that you have two of those iPhones. <laughs> okay? We have to be happy as developers because then we can code. That's what we do. Okay? That's what the managers do. Nothing else. No subtle control. If they don't keep you happy, they should be fired. They should be kicked out. And then senior leadership is like the generals in the army. Okay? So they do the strategy, but they don't care less of what you have to say. Okay? They, they have a completely different role. You fight, and they decide what you fight for. Okay? And so this is maybe controversial, but you should be focused. You should only think about code, dream about code, but you know exactly what to do, so you don't have to think about anything else. So you do what you want. You get your coding high. Okay? Because writing code is like being a drug addict. Okay? It makes you feel good if you get into the flow. We are just junkies. Okay? And we want to just be kind of high all the time. <laughs> okay, I'm nearly done. Now here's one thing, and I mentioned this as a joke, but I really mean it. There's too many amateurs in our field. Okay? And if you compare it with soldiers or with professional athletes, we still believe we have these fucking books. Learn Java in 24 hours. Imagine that you had a surgeon, okay, that read a book, surgery in 24 hours, and that would operate on you. Would you want that? No. So why the fuck do we let people that have no computer science background write code? Okay? Unacceptable. Unacceptable. Okay, call to action. This is my last slide. Okay? We and there's also a lot of things that we do wrong as developers. Why do you think this data scientist is now all hip and cool? Look at her. Look, at she looks kind of great. And then you look at the kind of web designer. It's like a skull. Okay? Because we are nerds. We are autistic. We have no social skills. And that's why people want, you know, the, the, uh, you know customers want something like her, not something like a skull. Okay, so we have to improve our social skills, just like soccer players. I mean, they can talk with the press. They have deals with, you know, Gucci and whatever. They look good. They, you know, they, they, they take care of their bodies. We should do the same. Okay. <laughs> so no more neck beards. Okay, shower every day. <laughs> Another thing, and I think this is a big problem in our industry, we're always fighting with each other. When somebody, like you know this, everybody has experienced this. You come up with a proposal, immediately your colleagues like cannibals jumping on you. That's a bad idea because of that, because of that. We are always destroying ourselves. We, instead of no but, we should say yes and. And you should all read this book, Bossy Pants. Or you should take a course in improv. Okay? We should not be killing ourselves. We should be helping ourselves. Okay? Another thing is that we're cheap. Okay? If you're a professional chef, you take your own knives to the kitchen. It doesn't matter whether in what, for what restaurants you work. Because your knives, that's your professional tools. Okay? And a chef's knives like this can be $300. Okay? And maybe they carry 10 knives. Okay? Even freaking plumbers. Okay, they carry around a toolbox that they pay for them themselves, worth hundreds of dollars. But what do we do as a computer scientist? Oh, 60 dollars, 60 euros for this license that's too expensive. I want software to be free. That's suicide. That's cannibalism. That's stupid. Okay, how can we make, how can we make millions of dollars? If we say that what we do has no value, 
we are crazy. We are fucking crazy. I'm sorry to say that, but do you see what I mean? We don't even value ourselves. So how do you think that other people can value us? Okay, we pay a plumber more to fix our toilet than we pay for software ourselves. This is, this is just, I don't know, this is crazy, okay? But then, this doesn't work for Agile, because we kind of take Agile courses and whatever, so let's start paying for code and not for bullshit, okay? And don't be a clown, vote with your feet. You don't have to take all this nonsense. So if your company has Agile, subtle management, you quit, and you start a new company with your friends. Okay, thank you. <laughs>